Okay, thank you. Is this going properly? Okay, can everyone hear me now? Yes. Thank you. So I'll get out of the way. And there's my bio, as uh, noted. Uh, and yes, I retired at the end of 2019 as well as retired from Cave Hill Cemetery. We have Lee Squires here, who's the uh, former super, superintendent of uh, Cave, Cave Hill. And some of you had a great discussion of Louisville history. I have done some books. These are just a few of the books that I still have remaining. But you can go on my website if you're interested. So today we're going to be discussing Louisville disasters, earthquakes, fires, floods, and tornadoes. And today is just a beautiful day. We don't anticipate any disasters today, I hope. So let's first talk about earthquakes. So this is a seismic map of the United States. The uh, dark uh, magenta colors show where there are uh, viable earthquakes happening, seismic zones. And if you look there where Kentucky is, in the far western part of the state, that's where the New Madrid fault line is, and that's a very active earthquake zone. Here's talking about the New Madrid earthquake zone, and that map there on the left shows uh, earthquakes just, I want to say that's just in the last 10 years or something of that nature, that they've had, we're constantly having little tremors from the New Madrid. And uh, here's uh, the major uh, earthquake that occurred was in the early 1800s, 1811, 1812 period. Actually altered the uh, flow of the Ohio River and the Mississippi River, I guess, at that point, uh, in part of the uh, state of Kentucky. Here in uh, the Louisville area, Soldiers Retreat, which is out off Hurstburn uh, Parkway, is one of the few structures that I'm familiar with that actually had damage from that earthquake. It actually notes it here on the uh, uh, historical marker there, earthquake of 1811, damaged the uh, soldier's retreat. That's a historic uh, house. And here are earthquakes, so what, within the last uh, 13 years ago um, that have happened. The most recent that I, I felt was 2008. I'll never forget being in my kitchen one early morning and I thought a huge truck just went up the street and then I turned on the TV and radio and they were all talking about the earthquake that we had today. Does anyone remember that? Yeah. It happened early in the morning like 5 or 6 a.m. so a lot of people were still been asleep. And we had some property damage. Uh, one of the buildings in downtown that lost part of its parapet there from that. And uh, we as architects, when we design buildings, especially in the western part of the state, we have to use spe special structural uh, designs. And this was a building that I was doing in the Paducah region, and we had to strengthen it. So now then, fires. So the Louisville Fire Department here, they became a, a professional firefighting force in 1858, as noted, that you see there. And prior to that, it was, it, it, if you had a fire, you were lucky if anyone showed up to help put it out. So, uh, yeah, it was a very uh, dangerous part of the uh, uh, times. And as noted, after 1858, property uh, losses dropped by 75% once we had a full-time fire fighting force. Here are several of the significant fires in Louisville history. Unfortunately, the, the most infamous is what's called Fatal 48. That's the box, uh, the, the fire alarm pool box at 6th and West Main. And as you can see, a number of firefighters have been killed in fires in that area. A lot of civilians have been killed uh, due to fires in that area. Some very tragic fires that occurred there in the vicinity of 6th and West Main. Here are some historic photographs of some of the firefighters back in the day. That's what we have today. <laughs> Things have vastly improved, don't you think? And firefighting uh, gear. So uh, this one photo, the black and white photograph, uh, that was taken in the early 1970s. And notice the firefighters, they do not have any breathing apparatus on. 
So they were actually breathing in all the toxins and the smoke that's created. Nowadays, all firefighters wear their, their mask and their oxygen tanks so they do not inhale that uh, dangerous carcinogen smoke. We had a lot of hotel fires back in the early, in the 1800s and early 1900s. This was one uh, fire that occurred, I forget what year this was, uh, 1963. But hotels were uh, infamous for fires, primarily because they didn't have sprinkler systems back then, and people would smoke in bed. Here's a good example of this, the Preston Hotel. This was at, uh, I think this was at 3rd and West Main and it had an infamous fire. The most famous hotel fire was the Galt House, the original Galt House. Uh, in 1865, it did burn down due to uh, someone smoking in bed. This is where that uh, original Galt House once was. They were at the old infamous uh, Whiskey Row area, but the old original Galt House was right there in 1865. This was an interesting um, uh, fire uh, here at uh, near uh, it was at Liberty and Third Street. This nice building that you see there on the left, it had a huge fire, and what was left was just this small stub of a structure that they turned into a parking garage. <laughs> And so there it was, there's that parking garage there, and the building, how it changed. And that's what's there today, the Omni Hotel. They all oh. was demolished. Oh, yeah. So yeah, that's, that was all demolished. Uh, believe it or not, in the early 1900s, I think this was 1910, um, the uh, city council wanted to change the fire regulations uh, for theater construction to minimize the travel distance from a where you're seated in a theater to an exit way. They wanted to lengthen that travel distance. We as architects were always interested in travel distance. How far does it take you to get out of a building such as the room that we're in here? You're probably talking about a 50 foot travel distance. But they wanted to lengthen it pretty long um, as such. And so fortunately my architectural brethren back in the early 1900s you see a lot of their famous names up there. They all revolted against this, and they went down to City Hall and said, no, from a life safety standpoint, we cannot lengthen travel distances or make it more difficult for a theater to get out of in, in case of a fire. There have been numerous uh, unfortunate theater fires in the United States. I think the, the worst was up in Chicago, where a theater caught on fire, and the exits were locked. And it just tre tremendous loss of life because of that. But uh, anyways, they uh, did not uh, accept that. The council decided not to do that. Here was a fire uh, down on, uh, this is West Market. Look at the crowd there, good entertainment with a fire. That's what's there today, the convention center. This was a uh, fascinating fire down at 6th and Washington Streets. Uh, West Main is just to the, to the upper portion there, but a big fire. And that's what's there today, the Kentucky Center for the Arts. The Park Moore Bowling Lane, some of you all may remember this. My grandfather lived near this, so I remember it pretty vividly when this occurred. And several firefighters were killed during this so uh, fire. Yes, I remember the whole The Ballard Mills fire uh, down on uh, East Broadway near Beargrass Creek. It had a big fire that burned down. Uh, Second Presbyterian Church had a huge fire, and it was destroyed. A fire back in the mid 1950s. And of course, they built a new. Uh, church out here off Brownsboro Road. First Unitarian had a big fire in the mid 1980s. 1985, I'll remember this. Um, it was very cold that night, and all the, uh, the water that the firemen sprayed on the uh, structure turned it into an ice palace. It was totally ice. I, I've been trying to find a photograph of that since. Uh, unfortunately, I cannot. But 
totally glazed over with all the water from that. And it has been rebuilt and uh, still exists down there. More modern type structure, but it survived. General Electric had a huge fire just a few years ago. Caused a half billion dollars in damage. You can see that smoke from throughout well, the city. Say, oh. And then uh, Whiskey Row had a huge fire. Also, just very shortly thereafter, this one yeah, was April 3rd, uh, 2015. Then uh, in July 6, 2015, uh, Whiskey Row had a major fire. Some of y'all may remember that. I was, I was involved in saving Whiskey Row. Uh, uh, believe it or not, the previous mayor wanted to tear it all down for some reason. That's, Horrible preservationist said, "No, you don't. We're going to fight you on this." I think I think we turned out pretty well. What has happened? But when this occurred, I'm like, "Oh gosh!" After all this effort of saving this, and now it's been burned down. But fortunately, it was saved and turned into a lot of nice shops down there. Hopefully, everyone's been down to Brown Farmers Distillery, uh, Oak Forester. It's a beautiful location. There it is. There's a firefighter's uh, memorial down at Jefferson Square that lists, unfortunately, all the firefighters who have been killed in action over the years. Oh my goodness. Another major uh, disaster occurred in 1893. The Big Four Bridge collapsed. This is a little dis description of the uh, uh, disaster. But... Uh, Basically, what happened was, and here's a uh, photograph of it afterwards. But you can see the scaffolding that was being built and all the workmen working on it. And a huge wind came along that toppled this scaffolding and all the workers fell into the river. There's the, now, this is the old Big Four Bridge. Uh, they replaced it. Um, this was just a, a single track bridge when it was originally built, then they rebuilt it as a two-lane track. And so you can see the difference between the old and the new. Taking everyone's walk the big four. Me and my wife do that regularly. In fact, we may do it this afternoon. It's such a beautiful day. We love the big four. But it has a tragic history. Ah, where were you in the sewer explosion? Oh, wow. <laughs> 1981. Here's a little uh, a description of it. But basically what it occurred was the Ralston Purina Company dumped a bunch of uh, 18,000 gallons of hexane um, chemical into the sewer system. And hexane is very volatile uh, chemical and kind of did some damage. Blew up the streets of old Louisville is what it did. <laughs> I'll never forget turning on the radio that morning and hearing about this, like, what? What was this all about? I could not believe this. Now, this was, like, 42 years ago. Ross Caprina, y'all may remember uh, going around I-65 on that curb when these uh, silos were there. But you can just see all the damage it did to the streets. It's more of an article t telling about it. The chlorine barge accident of 1972, and I remember this too. I was a student at St. X at the time, and this was a major deal. I mean, they were saying that this could devastate the city and do all sorts of nasty things to us. But essentially, a uh, barge carrying chlorine got lodged in the McAlpin Dam. There it is there. <coughs> And it took them some time to figure out how to get that barge out of there without releasing the chemical, which they fortunately were able to do. DuPont plant explosion. This was before my time, but a uh, very major uh, disaster in the west end of Louisville in the Rubbertown district. Yeah, I had no idea all this had occurred. Talking about the city's worst industrial mishap. Now, some of you may remember this, the winter of 78. 
Yeah. Thank goodness for global warming, right? <laughs> yeah, people walking across. I remember walking across the Ohio. I did not try. Did anyone try that? No. Well, someone did back there and said they did. <laughs> You're very brave. To my knowledge, no one fell through. But yeah, people walked across the Ohio. Right? What was that, uh, 45 years ago? Uh, floods, we're all familiar with these. Of course, the worst one was in 1937. Here's a map of where the flood waters happened, and you'll notice that most of it was in the west end of Louisville, where that dark, where that shade of blue is. Pretty much devastated the west end of Louisville. This is a southwestern parkway area, and that one large building that you see there is the Ford Motor Assembly Plant that was on southwestern parkway. But all of West Louisville was just flooded. This was Jeffersonville, Indiana. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to read where this was, but this is just looking, I think, towards the downtown area, Second Street Bridge there. So to tell you how high the flood waters were, if you do walk across the Big Four Bridge, at the very, on the Indiana side, they have these, pil these uh, pyramid-style pylons, and the color changes about midway up, and that tells you where the flood waters were. Wow. So where it goes from the dark green up to the lighter color. And then over at the Ship's Confectionery, if you ever go over there to get some candy, on their building, they have there at the second floor windows, an indication of how high the water was in the, thir in the 37 flood. Of course, uh, the Broadway, the old St. X. Uh, this is, in the center there is the downtown uh, library, and you see all the streets around it are flooded. We had Abraham Lincoln walking on the water. <laughs> Now this was how the photographer actually took this photograph. The water actually went up over his shoes, and so the photographer monitored the sculpture, and once the water got below his feet, that's when he took the photograph. <laughs> so it was actually higher than what you see there. Here's some more photographs of the downtown area with the floodwaters. That's Mill High School there. I think what was it, the Brown Hotel, they were able to fish in the lobby of the Brown Hotel. Yeah, there's, uh, this is a photograph from the Brown Hotel looking west on Broadway. This is the uh, Butchertown area, there's St. Joe's with the spires there on the right center of the photograph. Now then, the floods wiped out a neighborhood, believe it or not. It was called the Point Neighborhood. It was to the north of Butchertown, and this is an old map of the Point Neighborhood. And that red line right there uh, represents Frankfurt Avenue. If you go down Frankfurt Avenue, it goes to River Road, and all of you are familiar with that area. So uh, Frankfurt Avenue it was called Ohio Street back in those days. But, it's now called Frankfurt Avenue, but it would go right through uh, the Point neighborhood to River Road. And so here's a view of that same location with that red line of Frankfurt Avenue, so you can see where the old Point neighborhood was, and it's where the Botanical Gardens is today. They wiped out. The 37th flood wiped them out. Then when the 44th flood came along, they said, that's it, we're taking everyone out to move them away from the flood waters. The only two uh, structures remaining from the old Point neighborhood are the high gold facade that a lot of you see there on Frankfurt Avenue and the Paget House. Now recently the Paget House has been restored. It used to look like this. Some of you all may recall the old Paget looking like that. Well, us, again, horrible preservationists were able to get the developer to restore it and that's what it looks like today. So we were able to save that. I, uh, a lot of people ask me, what's the high gold facade? What does it say? What does the ornamentation 
say to it. And so I, uh, I did this little graphic a few years ago, which points out all of the uh, uh, patriotic themes that are on the high gold side. Christian Heigold was a German immigrant who came to America in the 1850s. Some of you all may have heard of the Bloody, Ru Bloody Monday riots of 1855. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, he being a German immigrant, he was caught up in all of that. And to prove that he was a patriotic American, he, cr he created this house with all these patriotic themes on it, saying, yeah, I'm an immigrant from Germany, but I'm now an American. And so, uh, it's a very patriotic memorial that he created. Here's the 1964 flood. Uh, this is in southern Indiana, this photograph here. Now look at all the livestock there around this house. How would you like to clean this up after the flood? Yeah. Some more, uh, more current floods. This was a 2018, 2019 flood. More of the 2018. I love this photograph here. It says River Road. It definitely is River Road. Some more photographs. Gray sculpture. That's, that's floating. A sculpture. The Bell of Louisville could have probably taken the trip on I-64 there. Look how high that is. Or that's 2022. That was just, what, two years ago. And, of course, to mitigate floods, we put up the flood wall. And uh, as you go down uh, Frankfurt Avenue there, where it turns into Story and Melwood and all that, the um, MSD created this uh, control station that has huge gates. Part of the problem that we had in the 37 flood, or any flood, was that the floodwaters would back up through Beargrass Creek and get out into the city. That's one of the main reasons how it did that. And so the uh, MSD created these, this sort of a dam, if you will, with these huge gates that during a flood event, they'll close off the gates to prevent the water from backing up into Beargrass Creek. Also down there, uh, Yamarina, if you get uh, are down there, uh, they have these huge flood control gates that they've installed now that they can close and keep the flood waters from coming into downtown. Sort of decorative design there. And um, now this doesn't have to do with river flooding, but just intense rainfall. Just recently, you may have heard that MSD, MSD created this huge tunnel underneath the city of Louisville that handles uh, overflow stormwater. And it's a huge thing. This huge tunnel that they put in under the city and see some photographs. The thing in the upper left-hand corner is the thing that cut the, uh, that cut the uh, tunnel. And then uh, you see photographs of the tunnel up above. And so what will happen is uh, overflow stormwater will be taken down into this tunnel then after the rain event goes away, they'll pump the water back out into the Ohio River. And this hopefully will prevent all the basements from being flooded. As you've heard over the years, basements get flooded and all that because we have a combined sanitary and stormwater system. It gets very messy and they've spent a lot of money on this and I hope it all works properly. Is that on Lexington Road? Yeah, Lexington Road is its one terminus. You can see at the... Uh, Grinstead Drive, Lexington Road area, that's one uh, exit point, and the other is there at the, uh, 12th and Rowan Streets in the western part of downtown. But that red line there is how the tunnel went. It's phenomenal. Yeah, I've seen I was able to go down. I didn't go down into the tunnel, but I was able to. They built this huge building. If you ever get down to see it, it's a beautiful building uh, where they have the, uh, this is looking down into the shaft down to the tunnel. It's phenomenal what they did. It's all underground. And again, some more talking about the flood and little Christ. I uh, did a healthcare project down at Logan and Broadway, the Family Health Center, and believe it or not, the, the uh, Corps of Engineers had me raise the uh, first floor to get it cooked out of the floodplain. I had to create a ramp system. We had to raise the floor by about 12 inches. Even though they're controlling it, it's still legally uh, in a floodplain. Don't ask me why. It's crazy. 
And of course, this book here by a good friend of mine, Rick Bell, under the Great Flood of 1937, in case you want to know more about all that. Tornadoes. This is a view of all the tornadoes we've had here in Jefferson County in the night, since 1830, it says. Got a lot of tornadoes. Of course, uh, one of the more significant ones was the 1890 tornado. It actually came from the southwest up into downtown, went across into southern Indiana, and then came back into Jefferson County. So it made a big arc through downtown and the area. There's some of the devastation from it. Oh. Yeah, pretty much wiped out West Maine. Wiped out this Catholic Church, Sacred Heart Catholic Church at uh, 17th of Broadway. It was demolished by the uh, by the tornado and uh, it was rebuilt in 1892. And has since been demolished again. We'll talk about that a little bit later. 1890 tornado. When it came back across the Ohio River, it wiped out the uh, water tower there in Zorn River Road. And then uh, a few years ago, they put up this monument to the 1890 tornado down at uh, 8th and West Main, which has since been taken down. We don't know what happened to this. We think this is in the uh, city's graveyard as well, of sculptures that they've done. Of course, the more infamous tornado that we all remember was the 1974 tornado. We're coming up to its 50th anniversary here shortly, next year, Harvey Sloan. You see Eastern Parkway there, we'll wiped out the Eastern Parkway there, near the uh, Cherokee Park. Franklin Avenue area. Like and this beautiful um, historic building called the Turrets here at Ken Kennedy Court, it wiped it out. And it's now a park. They totally demolished it after it was so severely damaged. Bardstown Road area, Cherokee Park. There's a before and after photo. However, the most damaged destruction of, on Louisville was delivered. Actually, actually, people intended to do what I'm about ready to show you, and it was a self-inflicted uh, damage that we did. So I'll explain this here. I call it after the bombings, urban renewal. Or as some of us historians and preservationists call it, urban removal. So here is a downtown Louisville. This is about the 1940s uh, period, everything in yellow there has been demolished. Oh, no. And we wiped out all of that. That's what it looks like today, the downtown core, but yeah. Here are some of the uh, landmark buildings that were demolished. Just beautiful buildings. Some of y'all may remember the Rialto movie theater. Here's a good example. This, again, was at the 3rd and West Main. Three old buildings being raised for a parking lot. Isn't that great? This was uh, 1959. A little article that talked about all this back in 1979. Talking about all the destruction. So the upper photograph is from about the 1930s. And yeah, 1926, and then the lower photograph is what it looks like in 1976, and it still looks like that today. We pretty much wiped out the western part of downtown Louisville, the historic African American business district they demolished, just whole scale demolition of things, and just the the thing that I that I talk about on this. Okay, we demolished it, but they did not re they did not have a plan to replace it, if you will especially with quality buildings. My theory is, yeah, you can demolish a landmark building. I'm okay with tearing something down, but replace it with a building of equal or better value. Do not lessen the value of the city. Maintain it or increase the value of the city. And unfortunately, they decreased. We lost billions of dollars of property in this manner. 
So here is a photograph, uh, a figure ground of buildings in 1900 of what the downtown area looked like. All the black areas you see there are buildings, and that's what it looks like 90 years later. How much they wiped out. Why? Why did they do it? Yeah. They were want they had good they had good intentions. They wanted to revitalize the city, and make the city better. But as I just noted, for whatever reason, they didn't have a good plan to to do it, to to replace it. And that is it. Thanks for viewing. So, uh, yeah, if you, any of you all lived through any of that, like the tornadoes or floods, if anyone wants to talk about that period, yes. Yes, if you would like that. Oh, you're just saying you lived oh. through it. Okay. <laughs> but yeah, I, if you well, want, I do if have a question. I do have a question, though. When you were talking about the urban renewal, yes. was part of that for more interstates and stuff? Was that part of it? Some of it was. Of course, where I-65 was, uh, along the river where I-64 was, there wasn't too much demolition there, but... Uh, I-65 took out about two city blocks between First and Brook Street. There, they they took out several historic, nice, beautiful churches uh, due to that. But yeah, that was fairly minimal uh, in relationship to what all they did. Other questions on that? Yes. Yeah, Lee. Uh, the 2015 fire, uh, the whiskey roll. You know, I think they blamed that on. Somebody using a, a torch, a plumber, Correct, or something. There's a construction did anybody, did that company have to pay for the? I think there was a lawsuit. And I think there was an uh, insurance claim on that. Yes. Yeah. Never, never so. came out in the, in the paper about what happened to that. Correct. I assume someone was guilty, found guilty. On that, that is correct. Yeah, a welder's torch uh, touched it off. Yeah, and unfortunately that has happened a lot. There was just a recent fire. I'm trying to think of what it was, but a similar situation happened. So yeah, it's dangerous. Yeah, when we uh, do uh, construction, especially in a hospital or whatever, which I do a lot of, we do what's called fire watches, where we will require, if we have to turn the sprinkler system off or the fire life safety systems off, uh, the construction people have to provide a person 24-7 to monitor their construction site. It's called a fire watch. And so, uh, you know, when we have to take down a sprinkler system to do some renovation, uh, we require the, the construction company to monitor it so those type things don't happen. Yeah, any other questions? I'll make, Anyone? Yeah. I'll make a comment. Uh, we were talking about the uh, 74 tornado earlier um, and how it missed Cave Hill. Um, that was my first year working at Cave Hill. Wow. I was 27. And um, That's okay, you don't have to give it. Yeah. <laughs> Too much so, um, it, it, it hit Calvary Cemetery, you know, and then turned east and went east after it hit Barstown Road. And uh, the manager of Calvary Cemetery called my boss at the time at Cave Hill and, and asked if our uh, uh, landscape crew and tree takedown crew would come over to Calvary and help them clean the roads mm -hmm. at Calvary. And so we did that. And, Maybe that's why seven. Calvary doesn't have as many trees as Cape Hill yeah, does. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the wow. seven-foot no tornado idea. took out all the big trees at Calvary. Wow. Okay, well, I had no idea about that. Oh, thank you, Lee. Yeah, I just missed Cape. Can you imagine a tornado going through Cape Hill Cemetery? Wow. Yeah, question in the back. Yeah, something that I remember that I don't think we saw up here was the uh, snowstorm from 1994. Oh, yeah. And I oh, think yeah. that was probably almost uh, You're right. Yeah, that was a major one. But 94, those of us who worked in health care, mm -hmm. I think there's a few in the room here, you know, we went to the hospitals and stayed for almost a week to keep mm -hmm. the place. And right. the ice storm that we had and you know, a wind storm, we, we had a lot of little yeah. you know, sort of minor disasters. <laughs> I'll never forget that 94, I went to get the newspaper on the front porch and I wondered why my storm door wouldn't open. The snow drift was so high up on the door. Couldn't even get the door open. You're right. Good point. But yeah, we had that windstorm, I think it was 2008, I think we had a huge windstorm, or was it an ice storm? The wind storm. The power was out for several weeks. That was the ice storm, 2009. 2009. That was like Hurricane Ice. Yeah, it was right, in 2008. Yeah. Yeah, I in the fall. 2008, and five months later, it was the ice storm. <laughs>
Good yes. Time. So we've lived through a lot. Let's hope that that's it for the time being, and uh, we won't have any more disasters in the future. And uh, fortunately, I'm looking around. Uh, we have smoke detectors here. I don't see any sprinklers, but we have some good exits here, so uh, we're all protected. So. Thank y'all very much, and hopefully that was of interest. And I've got some uh, presents for you folks here in just a second. Let me mark this off here.